I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're all meeting today and um, pay my respects to elders past, present and future and acknowledge that these lands have always been places of learning, te teaching and research. So welcome from whatever country you're joining from us today and from wherever you are, we're so pleased that you could be with us. <laughs> Um, and yeah, let's just have a great conversation this morning about a very topical issue, which I think um, has really come under, well, it's come into my radar for the, over the last sort of six months. And it was such an important conversation that I really wanted to get Irina to come and join us and have this conversation, because I think it's going to be really useful to you as leaders and practitioners in the sector, but also um, to the sector as a whole. So let's get going and I wanted to just kick off with a little bit of a question just to get you thinking about what we're talking today and if you've read any of Irina's work she talks about entrepreneurship being rocket fuel and I was very curious about that and so I wondered if we could just start off with a question to everybody when did you solve a problem at work and how did it go? And how did you feel once you either resolved that problem or you didn't feel you got, you, you know, you weren't able to? So let's put it in the chat or if anybody wants to share. When was the last time you solved a problem at work? Was it recently? Was it a long time ago? So you just put something in the chat to tell us when that was. And then how did it go? Did it go well? <laughs> Sally said sometimes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good point. We yeah. are often having to solve problems at work. How did it go? Anybody want to share? How did it go? Okay, Christina says it makes you feel like you achieved a good outcome for the people that you need to support. Yeah, great. So it made you feel good. Yeah, fantastic, Christina. Love that. Makes you feel more confident, yep. gives you energy to continue solving more energy uh, problems. Great. Glenn says work with film academics to manage project risks of the key person left. Yeah, great. Getting a CEO wow. to be brave to do something new that benefits. Yeah. So that's an interesting point from Millie that sometimes it takes courageousness, doesn't it, to solve problems. But I think what we're getting here is the idea is if you're able to solve problems, it feels really good. Yeah. And that's a really interesting observation, I think, that we can often become overwhelmed with problems. I know that we all, we all face a lot of problems every day and it's very easy to become overwhelmed. But when we're able to solve those problems maybe, and this is what I want to ask you, Ro uh, Irina, is, do, is it rocket fuel? What does it actually fuel us to be able to do? All right, mm -hmm. thanks, everybody, for sharing yeah. that. Those are brilliant responses in the chat box, um, Ruth. I hope you can capture some of that as well as part of the recording. All right, well, let's um, thank you for sharing, everybody, because yeah. this is the topic that we're talking about today. And when I met Irina, which was not very long ago, it was only late last year, I didn't know Irina, but somebody at QT actually told me that uh, Irina was part of this global institution that looked at, uh, institute, I would say, that looks at entrepreneurship and that there were awards going for people who were being entrepreneurs within their organisation. And one thing led to another and suddenly Irina was giving me a call saying you've actually won an award <laughs> for the work that you do at ACPNS. And so I was very honoured and privileged, obviously, to receive an, an entrepreneurship award. But I kind of had to really figure out what it was that I had actually done in terms of entrepreneurship, because I think we've all heard of entrepreneurship. That's a very common term that we know about. But I didn't know a lot about entrepreneurship and the fact that I was an entrepreneur. <laughs> Hooray. And um, so I was really excited about that. And so I started to read a lot about Irina's work and I started to read some of the research around entrepreneurship. 
And what I'm showing you here on the slide is something that comes from what Irina has written. And this, I suppose, was very curious to me because I thought, hmm, Irina, tell me, this looks like what you mean by rocket fuel. <laughs> and so let's, uh, let me, my first question to you, Irina, because you're both a, a, an academic, but you're also an educator and you're a practitioner as well, working with a lot of different companies and nonprofits. So can you explain what this means? And is this what you're talking about when you say entrepreneurship can be that rocket fuel? Sure. Thanks, Ruth. And thank you for that introduction. Um, and the first thing I want to say just before I launch into just talking about this model that you've put up um, is that so many people in the workplace are intrapreneurs and don't know it. And it wasn't until um, my book came out a few years ago that people from all over the world uh, reached out to me and said, oh, I'm an entrepreneur and I didn't know it. So it was just your experience, Ruth, which is that uh, they were solving problems, they were finding opportunities, they were adding huge value to the organisations in which they worked. Um, and, and there is now a unifying term that we can give to people like that who really are the lifeblood of the organisations in which they work, and that is entrepreneurs. So it's great to have, um, a, a, in a way, a label, in, in a way, an umbrella kind of a concept that gathers these people together and gives them a lexicon by which to talk about what it is that they do and who they are. Okay, that said, um, um, I was actually I was putting that question out yes. to everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's my question and I wanted okay. to just get people to uh, put in the chat what they think an entrepreneur is as you explain it from your perspective, Irina. All right. So if we, if we look at the model on the screen and sort of let me see if I can talk through that at the same time also illuminating the term intrapreneur. Um, if we think about the different levels here being uh, perhaps different levels of contribution and performance that people might might uh, experience within the workplace, um, you know, we, we let's admit that we do have people who are seat warmers. In other words, they they're happy to just turn up every day, do what they need to, go home. Okay, it's, it's they're not they're not there to invest themselves in the life of the of the organisation. You know, I, I think, you know that's just a, a fact of life and that's just a reality. Then we've got people who are really quite um, uh, committed to doing things the way they've always been done. <laughs> okay, We'll call them the rule followers and that's because that's worked for them for a really long time and they're comfortable with that and they get you know, they get uh, reasonable outcomes because they are uh, managing the process really carefully. But then we start to look at people who go, I don't think we necessarily have to do things the way we've always done them. And they begin to challenge and question the status quo. And these are the people who may not have the confidence to drive internal projects, but they do have the, the inquiring mind, the curiosity to say, can we do this better? You know, how else can we do this? Where's the improvement opportunity here? So we'll call those the questioners, and they are the ones who begin to stir the pot, so they're very important. Um, but then the next level is the problem solver. And the problem solver is the sort of person who not only can see the problem, like the questioner can see the problem, but doesn't have the confidence to solve it necessarily. But the problem solvers are the ones who go, ah, okay, that's a problem. I think I can have a crack at fixing that, or we can do things differently. And they get really great outcomes. And then the highest level, though, is this person that we'll call the opportunity finder, who is, who can do all of those other things. They can they can question the status quo. They can um, solve the problems. But then they also have that really strategic mindset that says, where are the opportunities that are emerging for us, either internally within the organisation, or externally you know how is the landscape within which we're operating changing and as a result is that 
bringing new opportunities across our paths that we wouldn't have been able to do a couple of years ago or last year even. Um, and that's the domain of the real intrapreneur. So if we think of an intrapreneur as being someone who brings their entrepreneurial spirit, their entrepreneurial mindset, their, that enterprising kind of bent within their personality and their attitude to work every day, almost as if they were sort of like the CEO of the organisation or the owner of the business to say, how can I show up today in a way that is going to make this a better place, that is going to be able to serve our customers better, that will, I don't know, engage our uh, community more effectively, that will make us um, more resourceful internally, where we can make better use of our existing limited resources. You know, where are all the ways that we can do better, be better? Um, and, and that's really the intrapreneur. So it's about being an entrepreneur and um, still nonetheless inside the organisation without leaving. So hence the term intrapreneur because intra means inside. And I think this is an idea whose time has come, Ruth, because we live in a world that is increasingly complex and it's becoming more and more and more what's referred to as VUCA. Uh, some people may have uh, come across that term, a VUCA world, which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. That's the hallmark of the world in which we live today. So as someone said earlier on, like solving problems, I can't remember who it was, was what they do all day. Well, that's become a hallmark of this, this new world in which we live. And I think this is why this is an idea whose time has come because organizations now are needing to really rally and galvanize that internal talent to be problem solvers and opportunity finders and not leave it up to just you know the CEO or the executive leadership team or you know the person with that designation in their role but actually crack it open and throw the doors open to all the people within the organization and invite them to bring their talent to the table to improve the organization's fortunes. Yeah, look, Irina, I'm really sensing that this is a bit of a shift in the way that we think about how organizations work, because as you say, traditionally, we've left decision making and ideas to the top tier of leadership, or we've waited for the strategy to come from the top. You know, it's been very much about what leadership can do. Whereas this is a sense that I'm, I'm sensing from you that this is about making sure that everybody can participate in strategic thinking and strategic ideas. And it's really motivating and empowering people to say, yeah. how can we solve problems within our, you know, not always outside our organisation, but within our organisations, how can we make it a better culture, a better workplace, mm -hmm. a better healthy workplace, a better productive workplace? If we actually... Um, tap into the people who's actually in the workplace yes. to come up with these ideas. Then we're getting people who are very um, empowered and people who are getting very excited about um, change rather than resisting change sometimes. Exactly. Uh, I love that you said that, uh, Ruth, that people can get excited about change rather than resisting it I, because I, I don't actually subscribe to that that commonly accepted um, thought that people don't like change. Um, and I hear that all the time, you know, people don't like change, people don't want to change. I actually don't think that's entirely true. I think people just don't like change that's been badly handled, you know, so through all the, through all the, you know, the last few decades when change management was such a big deal and the, the hot topic and everyone had to go and, you know, learn how to be a change manager. Um, I think, I think, possibly the reason why change has been given such a bad rap is because it's not been done well. And ironically, it's actually been imposed on people. You know, so we want you to change and this is how we're going to do it. Whereas the entrepreneurialism movement really is more of a grassroots movement which says, we want you to be the change. So we want to tap into your ideas of how we can change for the better rather than this is what we want the change to be. So um, that's why I really agree with you because I think that people are inherently 
smart professionals. We, we, our workplaces, we just have to start from the baseline level with the assumption that everyone who works in this organisation is a smart professional who is capable of being creative, who is capable of solving complex problems and start from that baseline rather than, oh, we better tell people what to do otherwise they won't know what to do. You know, so let's just change the paradigm and just go, we're all smart, you know, we, we, we've got the capacity, we bring a lifetime of, of professional experience to this role, we can figure it out. So using that as the paradigm shift, that really takes the responsibility of doing all of the strategic thinking, the planning, the driving of change away from the senior leadership team and from, from team leaders and from everyone who's got a formal leadership role in an organisation and shifts it, democratises it to, to the people who work within that organisation. Um, and the great thing about that is that um, it actually frees up the leaders in a way. It gives them back some headspace, the bandwidth to, to do more strategic type thinking. You know, if everyone in the organisation is solving the problems, then it's not their job to make the decisions on a day-to-day -day basis and micromanage people. And suddenly that can just like free them up to do some much more exciting kind of future focusing and visioning and strategic thinking about what the organisation could be doing, where it could be going, how it could be evolving itself to make an even bigger impact within whatever sector it is that it's working in. So it's actually a very liberating uh, way of thinking about the talent within the organisation. I think that we're already starting to touch on these reasons why this is such um, a beneficial kind of culture and place to work if you've got entrepreneurships. But Irina, we did say that we were going to tell people five great reasons why, um, you know, entrepreneurship was, was cool. And so I'd also like to hear from everybody what you're hearing here and what you think entrepreneurship could do and, be and how it could benefit your organisation, because this is great to hear from you. But I Irina, then could you sum up then sort of what are sort of some real reasons that we could go back to our senior leaders and say, hey, folks, you know, could we encourage more entrepreneurship within this organisation? What are the kind of things we could go and talk to our, our senior leaders about? Okay, excellent. Um, so, so we did. A, you did ask me about five reasons, or we, when we talked about this, we said let's let's go with with five reasons why entrepreneurialism is so important. And, and just before I jump into that, can I just um, make a really subtle, nuanced distinction about the reason why I talk about intrapreneurialism rather than entrepreneurship? And it really uh, came, it coalesced, my because I've always talked entrepreneurialism and I don't know why, it just felt right for me. And it wasn't until I read Simon Sinek's Infinite Game, uh, his latest book, that it really sort of gelled for me that um, entrepreneurship often in organisations is referring to a program that people do, you know, they go into an entrepreneurship accelerator or they come up with an idea, then they get permission to progress that idea and then, you know, they take it to market and it's done. Whereas entrepreneurialism is a way of living, you know, it's an ism, it's a philosophy, it's an ideology um, and it's more to do with you know having that infinite mindset which is that I am an entrepreneur rather than I'm in the entrepreneurship strand or the program which is more finite. So I'm just making that distinction there because I actually believe that um, that people who are genuine entrepreneurs they can't help themselves. It's actually who yeah. they are. They they are just like they <laughs> just. Something just dropped into my mind. I was doing a workshop. If you don't mind me digressing for a moment, I will come back to the five reasons in just a sec. Um, I was talking to a, a leader in um, a workshop that I delivered last year for Queensland Health, and um, one we were sitting down having lunch together, and she was saying, you know, this is before she knew about entrepreneurialism as well, and and she hadn't identified herself as as that until we did the workshop, and she said, you know, sometimes I would just get so annoyed with myself that I was always in the work. Every day I showed up, I was going, oh, we can do this better. We can do that better. And she said, I'm just going to take a back seat one day. She said, I'm going to show up. I'm not going to say anything. 
I'm just going to like head down, do my job. And she said, I lasted till half past 11. I couldn't help, <laughs> she said, I, lasted, I couldn't help myself. It was like, ah, I have to say something. I have to do something. It was literally like because it was who she was, she couldn't not be a problem solver. Yeah, so I love that. So it sounds like it's both a characteristic but also a culture. So it's yeah. it, you, you probably a culture enables that characteristic to be birthed in people or to be enlightened in people because, yes, I, I'm probably one of those similar yes. people where I just can't help myself look yeah. and say, we could do that better or how could we do that? Um, but yet the culture either enables it or uh, squashes it, you know. So let's get back to culture in a minute. Um, yeah, and I'm interested. Yeah, people don't have to say uh, about your own culture, but you probably already know whether your organisation is currently encouraging it or whether it's a bit squashing it. But Irina, let's get back to these five ways. Okay, we'll talk about the five about the five way um, ways that it will benefit organisations, and we'll take a deeper dive into culture a little bit later. Um, so, so in a nutshell, I think um, these are really critical. Then it's not the be all and the end all. You know, it's this is just a way of organising our conversation today. So, it will benefit organisations by helping them to be viable long term. Um, it will help their productivity, their employee engagement, and interestingly, employee mental health. And I mentioned that because mental health is such a big issue at the moment as well as um, the leadership capacity. So I'll just circle back to each of those in turn. Um, so first of all, the viability of an organisation will be completely transformed if it's got a critical mass of intrapreneurs within its ranks. Now that's um, just drawing on a lot of the research that you probably have come across already, most of you, about how the lifespan of organisations is shrinking quite dramatically. You know, back in the mid 21st century, 20th century, uh, a big organisation, multinationals, had a, a lifespan of about 75 years. Today, it's about 40 to 45. Uh, in Europe and in Japan, the average corporation only has a lifespan of about 12 and a half years. So there's there's a lot of um, a change in a world that is putting pressure on organisations to change and adapt quickly. And if they can't, then they're going to become irrelevant or extinct. And it's it's really intrapreneurs who put that energy and rocket fuel into an organisation to help the organisation to be more future ready. So I think that is a really crucial aspect of, of recognising the importance of having that critical mass of entrepreneurs within the ranks. Um, the next one about levels of productivity um, is, is like it's almost like a given it's almost like <laughs> it's so obvious to me that if you give people permission to do things better and to to figure out for themselves how they can add value that's going to skyrocket the their productivity and if you've got enough people doing that within the organization then you know the organization's productivity will will skyrocket um i'm a great fan of uh gary hamill who's a visiting professor at london business school and he wrote a book called Humanocracy uh, that came out uh, in 2020. And there was, a, there was a quote in there that absolutely captured my imagination and my attention when he said that an organisation has nothing to fear from the future or its competitors when it is brimming with micropreneurs. Now, he uses the word micropreneurs, but micropreneurs are individual intrapreneurs. So if you've got that critical mass of intrapreneurs within the organisation, you're going to be fine because they will find a way to figure out how to make that organisation work better and increase productivity or add new revenue streams or serve customers better, etc. Um, just one interesting statistic that that just uh, I was that I just thought of was that he also did some research and estimated that about nine trillion dollars of lost productivity uh, exists in the world just in the OECD countries alone because it's trapped in bureaucratic structures. Nine trillion dollars, which is just incredible. So um, if we can release 
uh, people to be entrepreneurial will will free up some of that nine trillion dollars so organizations can capitalize on their talent um, then there's employee engagement now if people are being given permission and we'll talk about culture in a, in a moment if people are being given permission to come to work bring their best selves use their creativity being supported to 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 get great outcomes like the ones that we saw in the chat box a moment ago they feel good about what they are doing as people were saying um you know they were feeling more confident it gave them a buzz um some of the the responses when you asked that question earlier ruth about how did it make you feel when you solved a problem now that gives people a sense of achievement and fulfillment within their work which increases engagement and you know we've all heard the statistics about how much disengaged workers cost organizations so um that's a really important one and the and the other aspect of it of that which is so timely for right now is because we're all hearing about uh, what's being referred to as the great resignation so people are thinking about what they want for their lives and how they want to be feeling um, when they are working and uh, have, have has everyone heard the statistics around the great resignation um, so it's being called the great great resignation because something like because of covid uh, it's different in different countries, but um, something like 38% to 40% of people, even in Australia, are thinking about leaving their jobs over the next 18 months. Wow. Um, Actually, I've heard a lot of them are coming into the non-profit sector. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Yes, because right. it, it's um, um, uh, so the resignation is also obviously happening in the third sector. But a lot of people from the for-profit and government are actually looking for more fulfilling work, yes. and so they're looking to the third sector to actually give them some of that fulfilling work. Um, but I think we are also having it in the in the third sector too. Yeah. I, oh, okay. I, I love that Sally's put in that it's the reflection pandemic. <laughs> Yes. So, so there are lots of great R's, you know, there's the, the great resignation, the great reflection, the great um, retention uh, by organisations that get it right, because they will actually retain their great talented people and actually attract more. So it becomes like more rocket fuel in their tank. Um, the other thing that is good for organisations is because, and this is really very fresh research that is literally just coming out of Canada right now that shows that higher levels of entrepreneurialism within a business are positively correlated with better mental health among employees and in and with lower levels of stress lower levels of exhaustion and burnt burnout and I when I saw that research and actually I was very excited about the fact that um, it was shared with me by one of the members of the Global Entrepreneurs Institute who is a researcher in Canada and you know, she said, oh, you know, that she, it was all in French. <laughs> so she, she, um, she said, I'll let you know as soon as the English translation is available. It was really exciting to see like hard data around this to say that entrepreneurialism in fact supports people's mental health. I thought, and I said to her, you've got to get this out there because it is such important research because right now there's a huge focus on how can we make our workplaces not just more productive and effective, but how can we make them places where people can have higher levels of, of well-being and, and mental health. So that's another reason why organisations should support entrepreneurialism. Um, and then the fifth one was uh, what I alluded to before about how um, it frees up leaders to do that kind of strategic visioning for the future of their organization because it, it gets it, it takes off that responsibility of having to make the decisions on a on a more operational level because they're trusting their people to do that so i think that's that's a huge one so any organization that is still clinging to that old you know the old methodology of command and control where well i'm the leader so it's actually kind of my job to make these decisions and that's what i'm being paid for etc they're going to really fall behind because 
that kind of a structure becomes the bottleneck for adaptation and change and innovation and future focus. So those are the five Reason. Maybe I'm just as you're saying that arena, I'm thinking that maybe the role of leaders is more about enabling those ideas to come to fruition. So we need decision makers who will give us the resources or the training or the technology like so the leadership actually um, empowers the ideas. Um, but then their job is to go away and actually enable it to happen because what we don't want is a lot of people with great ideas but it never happening because that can be the opposite of good mental health when you're constantly feeling frustrated and like you're not getting anywhere and no one's listening to your ideas. So is the role in this kind of a culture, is it that the role of leaders is actually trying to say, well, is that a viable idea? Because, you know, people, I come up with about a thousand ideas a day and they're not all viable and some of them are too expensive. And, you know, like I can't, I, there's no way that all of my ideas would be good, but maybe it's for the leaders to test and challenge or enable those, those viable ideas to happen. Uh, spot on <laughs> like like you just totally nailed that thank you Ruth I love that the way you've put that and and that is absolutely now the new style of leadership you know so it's it's the, there's this real transition uh, away from like 20th century kind of leadership which is about I'm the leader I need to make the decisions and make sure everything goes through me etc to the 21st century and not even the 21st century, the third decade of the 21st century style of leadership, which is going through a massive redesign, as is organisational um, health, that's going through a massive redesign as well. Um, it's very much about leaders taking on the role of being the enablers, as you've put it. So I, I talk about, and I, I wrote a blog recently, uh, a while back last year, about how leaders today are really more like talent curators and I use the term talent curators very deliberately because if you think of what a curator does and think in terms of an art an art exhibition a curator for a gallery an art gallery well their job is to acquire you know pieces of work of art that will um, that will add value to the to the gallery and then display them in ways that really, um, shows their their artistic value, and so they are responsible for putting the arts uh, artworks in in particular or um, configurations, lighting them, deciding how they could best be spaced out, etc. But with the overarching theme of some kind of like a unifying. Um, uh, vision for that art exhibition, even though you might have really different kinds of artworks being juxtaposed against each other. And the core, the core job there is to steward those works of art so that they are represented in the best possible way and increase their value. And I think that's actually what, what yeah. leaders need to do today. They need to steward the people within their uh, hegemony. We know if they're a team leader who's in their team, if they're the owner of a business who works in the business, if they're the CEO, you know, put out the word that what, what we really want to do is encourage people to grow in their professional um, skills. We want them to be able to challenge themselves uh, in what they're doing, get uh, challenge themselves in the work that they are accomplishing. And so that way they can grow their, their talent. Um, and then we will benefit from that. Yeah. And then it might be a case of putting different people together as their skill sets grow, you know, have very mobile teams and fluid teams where next project that we work on, well, we might have, you know, a different group of people based on the skill set that they've evolved over the last X, X number of months or years. So it's, it's a really different role for leadership, but I think it's a really exciting role for leaders to be stepping into this sort of like talent curation and enablement. 
So um, I first of all, I want to just ask everybody to put in a number. So one, two, three, four, or five. Uh, which one you think is going to most support your organisation? Mm. So do you think entrepreneurship? Uh, no, not entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurialism uh, could help your viability, productivity, engagement, mental health, or leadership. The role of leadership. Um, just pop that because I'm really interested to see which one you think would most help your organization. And then while you're doing that, I really want to just ask Christina because Christina is here and I've been working with Christina over the last couple of months. And Christina has a really good example because she is uh, a, an example of an entrepreneur who has been working with her organization. And Christina, can you just speak to what Irina said about how you were empowered to come up with an idea and how then your leadership supported you to make that happen? Yeah, so um, about well, eight months ago, um, I went to my general manager, so I work for TAFE Queensland, and we, I asked a question around um, working with Ruth around um, addressing uh, period poverty in our organisation and for our students and for our staff. So there was lots of stuff happening at the school level around our country and internationally, but nothing really um, in that higher um, educational space. So um, through uh, the men mentor program that we had, um, I was fortunate enough to have our GM as our man my, my mentor. Um, and I asked that question I said well what can we do about this we need to do something about this students are going to come through expecting this of us at some point um, but it's also our responsibility as an organization to support um, our, our student and our community and um, very fortunate to have a supportive leader um, who uh, who gave me the go ahead and has pretty much allowed me to run this project um, with guidance. So I've learned a lot about the leadership qualities and a lot of the stuff that Irene has been talking about, um, about empowering others to have really good ideas um, and, and bring them and implement them into the organisation. So now we're piloting a program. Um, another one of our regions um, is wanting to get on board now, which is really good. So we're slowly creeping across the whole of Queensland um, with the support of Ruth and um, reaching out to um, other organisations and being able to do that and being free to be able to do that um, has been a great benefit. So until Bruce said, you know, you're an entrepreneur, I'm like, what? <laughs> I just thought I saw a problem, I asked a question and implemented um, a solution. So being very solution-focused, I think, is a big quality of an entrepreneur is seeing it, identifying, asking the question. I love it because you've not said, you know, well, it was your idea, but it was your idea, but you engaged a lot of other people to make that happen. It wasn't just you coming up with the day and you making it happen. You yeah. know, you did say you asked a lot of questions. You asked questions of me who you didn't know before yeah. we called each other. Um, you asked questions of your leaders. You asked your students. You know, your problem solving wasn't in isolation and just very narrow-minded. It was very much about engaging people to come up with what could we do to really improve the student experience. And so, you know, after all these conversations, that was when you went back to your mentor, who happened to be your GM, yeah. um, and she got right behind it. So I just think that's a lovely, really great example of um, a culture and a, and a, and a leader. And, and a men a TAFE is a big organisation, so you're going to probably find that it works better in some regions or campuses than others. Um, but in your case, um, you've been able to get that leader who has really supported you and um, now having the most massive impact on people's lot on these students' lives, and not just students, actually, staff as well. Um, 
So, wow, that must feel really good, Christina. Yeah, it is. And it, um, I love that, um, Irina, you're talking about the mental health aspects and how it um, makes people feel <laughs> good about working in the organisation because one of the reasons why I, I asked that question was because I was not quite content with where where we were heading as an organization and you know and my my philosophy has always been improve a student's life and it has a massive benefit on lots of other things and so um for me it's been um a great um it gives me lots of joy um it's a lot of work because it's on top of what i'm my my real job but it is um the mental health aspects is really important and we've got a, a volunteer committee and the committee um are finding lots of joy and um and excitement out of being part of the project as well and then you start to talk to other people from other regions and they're like when is it coming to us like so there's lots of people that are really excited by it um and what I've learned is you just you just have to be brave enough. Someone said you have to be brave, but it is true. Brave enough to ask a question and brave enough to get a no as well. I think it's it's okay to ask a question, but if someone says no, it's like, okay, that's fine, but at least I've I've tried. Um, and there's probably really good reasons why. And let's try and figure out how we can work with what we've got. Yeah, that's really important, isn't it, Irina? The, the fact that sometimes your initial idea might be no, um, but then you've got to keep saying, okay, well, how could we do this another way? So I'm wondering, mm. Irina, mm. can you talk to us about resilience? How yeah. resilient do we need to be or how do resilient does the culture need to be within our organisations if we're going to encourage? Because I'm thinking of a, of a, a very sad situation where I was working in an organisation, not QT, in a previous organisation, um, where uh, a colleague of mine had taken her idea to leadership and when I spoke to her she was very despondent and I said what happened you know what, what how, how did you go and she said no nah, they didn't like it no nah. and she said so that's it I'm never going to talk about an idea again I'm just that's it you know um, and I was very devastated for her because she's beautiful, very problem-solving kind of person and to, for her to feel really squashed and 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 I can't even remember what it was, the idea that she'd come up with. So it could have been very valid that they kind of said, look, that's not viable, we can't do that. Or it could have been, I don't know, the culture and it could have been, you know, they just squashed her idea, I don't know. But the point I'm trying to make here is that perhaps as entrepreneurial entrepreneurialism needs to be coupled with resilience and, you know, yes, as Christina said, not being afraid of the first no, but okay, well, the first idea is a no, but then how could we do it in another way or how could we make it more viable? Um, I know that sometimes even with people working with me, I say, God, that's a great idea, but come back to me with a plan, you know, or come back to me with ha uh, an action plan in terms of implementation cost. Let me know how this is actually going to work out. So is there, is there, a, is there, Irina, something in this about resilience? Do we need to encourage people to be resilient? Yep, uh, there absolutely is. And, and Ruth, if I can, uh, if you don't mind me giving a bit of a plug for the Professional Certificate of Entrepreneurialism that we've just launched through the Institute and that I've, I've written and it's been a joy to write it because it's pulled together so much of my professional life and my learnings over 40 years of being an educator, um, I talk about the 12 skills that entrepreneurs need, or the, and they're not even skills, they're sort of like capacities, but people don't understand the word capacity, you know, it's a very abstract. So I talk about skills and attitudes and methodologies. And one of the 12 skills that we really focus on is determination, which is combined with resilience, combined with grit, et cetera, because um, if people can go into um, idea presentations to, to others, n um, not taking it for granted that those ideas will be accepted, but taking it as for granted that they probably won't be, what they'll do is have a number of those 
uh, arrows to their bow to how else could they do it. You know, so if we actually teach people to say, okay, if your idea is not accepted the first time round, what else can you do? How do you need to influence? How do you need to prepare? What's the language that you need to use? Have you read your organization's strategic plan? Do you know what their key um, objectives are over the next couple of years? And how can you couch the way you present your idea to the CEO, the general manager, your, your supervisor in a way that looks like it really aligns with where the organization is headed. So there are some skills around how to take your idea forward yeah. and how to get it listened to. And it's really important that people don't just kind of front up with, with something that looks really half-baked, that doesn't look like it's been properly researched or properly um, thought through. So there are ways and ways of, of getting ideas uh, accepted. So what happened with your friend is, is very sad, but um, there's a great learning opportunity there about, I think I need to de develop my skills in this area because, you know, the barriers to entrepreneurialism can come from external factors outside the organisation, um, within the organisation even, but, but internal factors inside the intrapreneur. So the intrapreneur might have their own barriers to get through if they don't have a skill set that will support them through that process. And it definitely does require resilience. And I think it's important to be overtly aware of that process. Christina? So I totally agree with that, Irina. When I went to the GM the week before I did... I created this mind map and got my research together and linked it all to our values and now our strategic plan and um, all of that kind of business. So when I went with my question, it was like, oh, this is what I've got. Look at this, blah, 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 blah. And then it was like, well, what's what's this? The, the first question was like, yep, okay, that's okay, but what's your strategy? And I went, well, this was my first step in my strategy to get you to say yes, and then I'll come back with a, a plan of attack because I didn't want to get too far down, down the process or get myself too excited because I went in with, well, there's a possibility that it will say, you'll say no. So I just wanted to go, here's my plan. I'll get your approval first and then I'll, I'll give you something. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good point is sometimes we do need to take people on the journey, especially leaders who are decision makers. And if we want them to tick, up, tick off on our plan, uh, we want to take them on the journey and uh, not always go in with this, you know, 50 million PowerPoint slides, um, you know, about, you know, everything. And you've put so much investment and you're so excited about this. And then they go, but you haven't thought about this, you know. So I do like the idea of taking decision makers on the journey with you. Um, so we are coming very close to the end. I can't believe it, Irina. We've got so much to talk about. But I do want this slide just talks about the Entrepreneur Awards, the summits and awards ceremony. Uh, you recorded last year's, and I was there, and I know it was an amazing summit. So if you want to listen into that, I highly encourage you because there are some great resources researchers but also practitioners from a number of different industries that talk about entrepreneurialism um, in their organisations. So I highly recommend that. Um, I'm also going to go back and just tell them, Irina, that you also are editor of the Entrepreneur magazine. Um, and this is also a great place if you want to be inspired um, by other entrepreneurs and learning about how different people are in, um, embracing entrepreneurialism um, and obviously read some about some great leaders who are encouraging that within their organisations. And maybe you could pick up a copy and just subtly put it on your CEO's desk or something, you know. <laughs> you, might, um, you might know the leader that you kind of just want to say, hey, guess what, I've just ordered a new magazine and here it is. Uh, you know, when you're having a little coffee break, pick up the magazine, all right. So that, there's a little tip for you. Um, also, Irina does lots of other resources and also her book um, called Entrepreneur um, is a great book. Again, if you want to buy it for your team or your office or if you have a book club at work, uh, feel free to get the book and actually use it as a discussion starter in your team meetings. 
because I bet your bottom dollar that a lot of other people will not have heard of the word entrepreneurialism. And so this is your opportunity to start that conversation at work with your colleagues or with your leaders and start to talk to them about how it could benefit your organization. And I did really love it that you'd all put, you know, uh, you'd put a number like five, three, five, five, four. You all, out of those five ways, and those are just five benefits, um, but you'd all sort of said, yeah, these are how it could really help and support our organization. So I think there's something for everybody and for every organization, uh, whether you're uh, non-profit, social enterprise, philanthropy, uh, a, a, a company, a, a, a for-profit company or government, I think that whatever industry you're from, um, this could really benefit you. So, so that is lots of ideas for you um, to take this information back, do some more uh, learning about entrepreneurialism and how it can support you and your organisation, but not just internally. We know that the ripple effects are that this is going to really help your clients or your community, your beneficiaries, whoever you're working with, like Christina's students, uh, really benefiting their lives, um, not through the traditional education way but through other ways as well so so i'm really excited thanks christina for sharing your story and uh, we are all cheering you on at tafe um, to make uh, period poverty eliminate period poverty at tafe um, that is what we want you to do so thank you no it's been great and you've been um ruth has been amazing uh, just from an email go let me let help me help me <laughs> she's been amazing so it's been yeah amazing. get get your cheer squad around you yeah. um and really anything's possible um allison just said do we have a slide of the five reasons we didn't make a slide but i reckon we could do that irena i think we could put a slide together and then i'll email it out to everybody um i don't usually email out the the because we only have a few slides for tm buns uh, even though i'll put up the recording uh but we could definitely make a slide of those five reasons that you might be able to take to your organization let's do that that's an idea look Absolutely. you see Alison is an entrepreneur <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ruth can I just uh, can I just say that the entrepreneur magazine is a digital publication oh. so you, you may not be able to go and put it on the table of the CEO to read okay. over it, but you could certainly send it to someone uh, with the link and say have a look at page 45 or you know 10 or whatever, there's a great article there. Oh, and there are some incredible stories in there as well of people who've done the most amazing things. So yeah, just go over to the uh, Global Entrepreneurs Institute website and you'll be able to have a, right. uh, a look at all of the all of the co uh, copies there. Can I also just say a quick hi to Tanya Matthew because she's joining us from the States. <laughs> so, oh, Tanya! Um, Tanya's in my in my network and um, I, it must be like something like some ungodly hour of the, the night over there, I would think. I'm not sure. But hi, Tanya. Oh, it's only 8 p.m. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So we this is truly a global uh, a, a global get together, a global meetup. Good to see you, Tanya. Yeah, well, great to be with you. Thanks. Well, you know, I think that's wonderful because if you go to the summit, um, you'll see some real global um, people who are doing some amazing things from across the world. So we can really be inspired by people near to us like Christina or far and wide. So that's another great reason to kind of join this movement. Yeah. Um, thank you, Irina. We are going to have to finish up. Thank you yeah. to everybody. Has today really inspired you, encouraged you, given you some tips? Do you think you can go away and sort of think about this more or, or start some conversations i would always love to hear any sort of outcomes that occur from team buns um, because i want to make sure that team buns is always about making the world a better place and uh, so if you do have any stories over the next couple of weeks and you want to share it with me please do uh, we'll be having more team buns as the year goes on and we usually touch on a lot of different topics so if you have any particular challenges in your organization or you're looking for some research or 
or you're looking for some uh, thought leadership about a particular topic, please feel free to email me and um, and I will find someone um, that we can chat to and uh, awesome research that we can share. So please stay uh, connected. Uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, once the recording is up, please feel free to share this recording with your colleagues um, so that they can listen in as well. And uh, we'll see you soon at another event uh, at ACPNS.